did you first grow curious about the paranormal? Dare you dig deeper? You are listening to Howl's of Asher. This is House of Asher, and you're listening to episode 62. And uh, as you know, I like to kind of bring different elements that touch on things from the paranormal, and sometimes that touches on darker, darker subjects. And not everything is uh, rose-colored and all that. And and sometimes you touch on the dark parts of life, and that's just uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, penalties or casualties of being part of the human condition. And uh, my following guest is actually very uh, astute at this and has learned a lot about the human animal. Uh, my next guest uh, is an author, a filmmaker, publisher, and investigative historian. Uh, this gentleman has done it all. He's seen it all. And he's seen, uh, again, you know, definitely the brighter sides of humanity and some of the darkest uh, corners of the human. So uh, I would like to introduce my next guest, Mr. Peter Bronsky. Hello, uh, hi, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm you know, uh, every so often I'll have someone on and that, you know, I've, I've kind of been following what they've done for, for years and, and you're one of those guys. And so I'm sort of taken aback. <clears throat> and, and again, I really do appreciate you being on. So uh, let's, let me my, my, you. my pleasure. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you. Um, well, let me ask you this. And, and I know it's probably a, a generic question, but I, I'm curious. Everyone has what I call a Batman origin story. Everybody had something that triggered their interest in something, triggered their curiosity, their study of what in the world brought you into being curious and having an interest to the point of wanting to research and write and dig into serial killers. Um, oh, well, you know, it's a story I've told off of, um, you know, in, in, in my books. Uh, I had this random encounter when I was a young man, when I was 23, um, with a serial killer fleeing the scene of his crime. Um, he had uh, killed two women in a hotel room, and I was trying to check um, into that hotel. And, and so as, as, as he, you know, he set his room on fire, uh, beheaded the two women and was um, fleeing from that uh, scene. And we kind of collided in the elevator doors. And, and of course, I ha- had no idea, of, you know, what had what had happened. Um, you know, this was just a guy on an elevator who had annoyed me. He had held up the elevator. And, and so it was kind of slowly revealed to me layer by layer um, as, you know, first there was the, you know, the fire alarm in the hotel. I never ended up staying there. Um, I just went on to some other place. The next morning I read in the newspapers, um, you know, two headless torsos um, killed in the hotel. And, and, and um, I had not thought of the guy I had collided for until until about a year later when he went on trial and I saw um, newspaper pictures of this individual. And, and, and so um, it just began to fascinate me. Like, what thing was this? You know, because this happens in 1979 and, and, and the word serial killer had not been coined um, outside the law enforcement community. It was not a term used by the media. It was, you know, there were no serial killer movies. You know, we used to refer to them as slasher movies. Um, that term wasn't there for me to kind of comprehend what it was that, that you know, I had experienced. And, and, and so that triggered in me this you know, decades long curiosity as to where these, you know, monsters, creatures were coming from. And of course, gradually I kind of grew into as the term serial killer became, um, you know, uh, entered into our pop popular lexicon. I began to kind of explore uh, 
uh, you know, various serial killing cases as they were happening, um, you know, by the early 1980s, that term was coined, and, and of course, the whole notion of profiling, um, you know, none of those things in 1979 uh, were, were well known. I mean, the FBI profilers essentially were profiling, um, you know, hostage taking uh, hostage takers. It was all about that. So, so you know, the the kind of Resler, John Douglas, and Burgess um, visits with serial killers. All those things were unfolding still in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, so that's what triggered my uh, my kind of uh, lifelong interest in serial homicide and its and its history. Well, you know, because you're talking about in in that time frame of, like you said, the late seventies, early eighties, and uh, you know, I remember stuff like you know, like when they had like the, I think it was like a Pan Am flight where they had like, like the uh, when I think Carter was president back in the day, and and they had like a whole lot of things like that, and that was sort of like you said the hot button thing, and that was the thing everyone was like you said yes. really geared toward, and uh, so but then this slowly came along. Um, when you encountered this person, you know, and and I'm sure for, uh, I would assume that, or maybe everyone assumes this. And it depends on if they've worked in law enforcement or not. If did they have you ever had someone go, Well, when you encountered this guy, did you just know something was wrong with him? Could you feel it? Did, was there a, a sense? Was there anything like that? Or was it just like this guy was a jerk and Well uh, it was like this guy was a jerk and the only thing that seemed wrong um was that he had this kind of sheen of sweat on his face. Um, you know, it's kind of shiny in the early December morning um you know coming from uh, from inside an elevator um that really and 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 of course he kind of looked through me he didn't really catch my eye it was as if um you know he was looking through me like as if i was transparent and and like a ghost and he practically walked walked through me as if i was not there so there was that aspect of a a, a kind of zoned out zombie like um uh, you know, aspect to him, but uh, you know, New York is a crowded city, and you're constantly bumping into all sorts of characters in various states of, um, you know, sanity or, um, you know, inebriated and, and and so forth. So it didn't particularly jump out at me as anything um, sinister. Um, he just looked like uh, a thirty-year-old white New Yorker. Which is exactly what he was. I mean, he was from New Jersey, uh, but he commuted to work in in, in New York. So, um, ordinary guy, right? Um, and the only other strange thing about him um, was just his hair. There was there was it was kind of a, you know I recognized basically almost his his haircut. Um, uh, you know, if you if if you know you had asked me to describe his face, I. I don't think I could, you know, I don't remember, for example, if he had a mustache or whether he was wearing glasses or oh, none of those details. It was like um, it was just his strange hair. And in fact, I learned later he was wearing a wig um, and, and other witnesses. I'm, I'm just, you know, working on that case. And I've been looking. I finally found, um, you know, the original trial transcripts and, and some of the police reports from that era, um, you know, witnesses um, in that hotel also just report all their memories of him about his hair. Right? And, and just last week, I guess, like you know, I'm, I'm interviewing him now. Um, and so just last week I had asked him a, a, a about that and you know, he says that he deliberately wore this wig, this flamboyant wig he described that that would draw people's attention away from his face. So, what I was actually looking at uh, probably was the wig, not 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 his real hair. Well, so that I mean, he accomplished his goal. I mean, that's the thing. Yes, too, being uh, being originally from a very small small town. When you know, I know the first times when I visited places like Chicago and, and out west around Texas and area, you know bigger areas like Houston and stuff, um, most people it's not that they're it's not that they're trying to be not neighborly. It's just 
a, that many people, if you stopped and conversed like you would in a small southern town, yes, you yeah, greet, a, right? You yeah, know, and it's of not course. That, and it's not so much that they're trying to look at you like you're a piece of furniture, but th- there's that thing of okay, I have to be from here to here, catch and you got to go by a lot of people, right. yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. Just, they're just not that they're saying that they're obstacles, but to a point they are. You know, you're trying to get through without yeah. any hub. That's right. And, and so, you know, how how yeah. easy is it to walk past somebody, maybe who has a certain amount of a social uh, uh, sociopathic tendencies, and just go, oh, well, he's just he's just a busy guy, you know? And that's just another guy, exactly, exactly. So he was just another guy on the elevator who, like I said, kind of annoyed me. Um, and uh, you know, uh, when I returned back, you know, because I was visiting New York from Toronto. So when I returned back to Toronto in in the first year of my telling this story of telling this story to my friends, um, the story was about, you know, the fire, um, how I was trying to check into this, uh, you know, cheap hotel in New York. And, um, you know, I couldn't check in because there was a fire. And then I learned that there were, um, you know, two torsos set on fire. Ha ha ha. Here's a typical New York story, right? Um, the, The guy on the elevator, I had forgotten about him, after you know probably within five ten minutes it's the fire that became the big story uh and and so it's only you know a year later as they say that when you know he was put on trial and all these pa- in papers his his uh, face appeared that that suddenly i connected um the guy in the elevator just came out of some deep cell memory um, I suddenly realized, you know, that was him. There is, you know, that invisible monster. He, in fact, uh, several months later, he killed a woman in a motel um, in New Jersey. Uh, you know, one of those big type types of motels, like a Holiday Inn quality. And um, he s- stuffed her body underneath a bed where housekeeping staff um, found the bed, clean, found the body cleaning the room the next day. Uh, three weeks later, he returns to that very same hotel uh, with another victim, and nobody recognizes him as he's checking in into into the hotel. Um, he was that invisible, and and that in fact is his downfall, because as he begins to torture um, the the woman he had brought there. Of course, the hotel staff are spooked from the murder three weeks earlier. Um, and the moment they hear someone screaming, uh, they call the police and, and he's literally caught red handed torturing um, this this uh, young prostitute in, in that hotel room. And, you know, he hasn't been out for 39 years well, since that day. You know, that's the thing. It's really interesting because, uh, <coughs> excuse me. You know, if you watch stuff like, you know, like ID Network and that kind of thing, you know, you always have these people like, well, OK, well, they cruise the red light district or they picked up hitchhikers or, you know, they would pick them up or take them down a lonely stretch of road on I whatever. Um, but this guy yeah. was really brazen. Uh, did he just feel that he was he, he was um, a definitely he thought he was untouchable. Um, he himself said to me, you know, I thought I was smarter than everybody else. He's very intelligent, so one can see why he would think that. Um, he uh, described to me how he would switch things up, how he was very forensically aware. Uh, and, you know, this is quite interesting, too, because, again, this is an era before, um, you know, the idea of serial killers. So he himself would not have this concept of, you know, what a serial killer does and and how you know police might investigate him and and so um he nonetheless he would uh, you know often change his methodology um so he would cluster some attacks in a certain geographic region that he'd move somewhere else uh sometimes he transported the bodies to other places across the, you know the state line from New York to New Jersey New Jersey to New York um he would sometimes uh strangle them sometimes suffocate them um there were you know all sometimes rape was involved sometimes it wasn't uh so when police were looking at these cases 
um, there was a kind of a linkage blindness. They did not link them to the same perpetrator. Um, he, though, you know, I think what happened with him is, of course, his family life, you know, because he, he was married with three kids. Uh, and so I think his family life began to disintegrate in, in that period. Um, his wife now was uh, suing for divorce. Um, and, and he was, I think, over drinking, over concerned about, um, you know, what was going to happen to his family. He um, apparently was, you know, very loving towards his kids, um, kind of the good dad. Everybody remembers, uh, you know, the neighbors and stuff kind of. Um, you know, him taking out his kids, trick or treating, you know, um, I, I, I saw letters that his kids wrote to him in when he was in prison, uh, after, you know, after he was uh, caught and convicted. And um, the sense I get, although I haven't talked to the children, you know, they're all adults now, the, the sense I got was um, at home, there wasn't any kind of hint of um, this dark uh, side of him, um, yet at the same time he was completely, uh, you know, out of out of control, and and uh, you know, not only um, was he, you know, picking up women in singles bars and and prostitutes and and, and so forth, um, he also had two mistresses in New York City at the same time, all right, uh, nurses. Uh, so, so he had this, this, I don't know when he had time, uh, yeah, to do saying, anything, what is he you doing? know, when you think about it. Yeah. You know, and he didn't sleep very much. Um, he was kind of like Donald Trump, you know, he never needed a lot of sleep. Uh, a few hours was enough. All right. So, you know, there are people like that, uh, who are just physiolog physiologically don't need that sleep. Um, he worked the night shift. He would work from 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, as a computer console operator. Um, this was in an era, you know, when computers were still run off uh, punch cards and, and you know, uh, half-inch uh, magnetic tape, right? So his job was, you know, mounting the tape, loading the punch cards, processing this data for Blue Cross Insurance. Uh, a job that he steadfastly held for something like over 12 years. He was, you know, a valued um, employee who, you know, had a choice of shifts. And so he chose this this night shift and, and he would get off work at 11 o'clock and then he would go see his mistresses. He would, um, uh, you, you know, a lot of the women he attacked survived. Uh, so his thing, I think, you know, the women that ended up dead just died on him. Um, it wasn't that he was setting out necessarily, you know, tonight I'm, I, I, I have a feeling that I want to kill somebody. What he had was this, um, need to, uh, restrain and torture and, and scare a woman. He talked about, what turned him on the most was seeing fear in their faces. Um, and, and so, he, if, you know, some women he brutalized literally to death. Others were found in the same condition that they found um, the dead victims, but they were found alive. Uh, and, and so I suspect that he, once he was done, he would just dump them and he couldn't care less whether they were alive or dead. And, and so he probably is not even sure which ones he killed and which ones he left alive. Hmm. Well, I, I'm assuming that he went through the classic, you know, starting torturing animals or, or things like Not that. Not at all. Really? Not at all. That's that's the amazing thing, too. He um, he had homing pigeons, uh, and, and he tells me that, you know, when a homing pigeon would um, break a wing, um, he couldn't wring the pigeon's neck to kill it. He would have to call his father to do it for him. Uh, he described to me uh, seeing a police officer uh, shoot a homeless man's dog. It attacked him. And, and I could just see in, in the way he's describing it that, that uh, you know, he's got all these emotional feelings to seeing that dog 
um, you know, uh, shot, which he hasn't that same feeling for human beings. So, so I, I did search for that, um, you know, McDonald triad, uh, you know, arson, setting arson, uh, you know, he claims now, you know, the problem, of course, with these guys is they're going to tell you often, you know, what they want to kind of let you know or what they want you to think. So, you know, he claims that he didn't wet his bed in any kind of unusual, um, uh, you know, uh, frequent way. Um, he had no interest in uh you know, setting fires or fires and, and, and certainly animal cruelty, um, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, in the same way I, 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 where we, where I interview him, um, is in contact visits. So there are other visitors in that room and, and people bring their kids in, you know, and as kids are running around the room, um, you know, I can see that he looks at those kids and, and, he kind of thinks of his own kids. There's there's not a kind of a predatory thing coming off him as he looks at kids. I think this genuine fondness he has for kids and animals. Um, adults is where he has some kind of, in particular, female adults. Um, but, you know, he victimized a lot of males in other ways. Um, you know, he had a loan sharking business at, at, at work. He um, was a thief and a burglar at the same time. He was fencing stolen goods, and, and many of the goods um, were those taken from his fellow fellow employees. Um, so, you know, there was this kind of... Um, thieving aspect to him and in the same way as he was targeting prostitutes his his big game as he would call it um was to engage a prostitute and um trick her out of her money which which you know as a former police officer is a hell of a uh you know is a hell of a feat uh, right you know prostitutes right. are very sharp when it comes to the question of money uh so his thing was you know how to be able to calm a prostitute out of free sex um and 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 uh, you know so this was this was the killing in the end you know, was a big part of a whole other psychology that he was engaging in, um, which I still don't quite understand. You know, I'm not finished with him yet, uh, but, but you know, where he crossed that line from just, you know, petty crime to this kind of pathological sexual crime, uh, hom you know, homicide of this kind, um, is still a mystery. He's, he's a, you know, he's a very unique figure as a serial killer. He doesn't fit the mode. His family, you know, the middle class. His dad was an executive at Metropolitan Life Insurance. Um, I visited, you know, the places he lived. Uh, you know, if you had to bring up a, a, a boy not to be a serial killer, you would have brought him up as, as he was brought up. Uh, you know, he had a stable family. Um, you know, he says his dad was a kind of a weekend drinker. Uh, so, you know, his dad wasn't really around on the weekends because he'd be down the road, um, uh, you know, in the bar. So, uh, but, you know, there's no, no sense that, you know, his father was abusive toward him. Um, no, no prostitutes that his dad was going to visit or exactly. Like yeah. That. You know. And, and, you know, I asked him, do you think your dad was living a double life, um, uh, you know, in the way you did? And, and first he said, no. Nah. And then he said, well, you know, I don't really know. You know, he probably thought of himself right at that moment. I, I don't really know. But uh, nothing that he could have seen. Right. And, and, you know, his dad was a hardworking, like I said, but he was a, eventually he was a, a vice president. Um, at, at uh, Metropolitan Life uh, in, in like their mortgage division. And, and uh, you know, he had three sisters, older sisters, uh, sorry, younger sisters. Um, he lived in, you know, his, his mom was at home, uh, a, you know, 
typical 1950s housewife, right? Um, so as we say, you know, where's the trauma? What was it that, 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 that took him to this dark side? And, and I think he knows. He's just not telling me yet. Um, you know, he had juvenile convictions at, at when he's 12, uh, he's arrested for, on five counts of burglary. Um, uh, and, and, and then again, uh, when he's 16, he's arrested, but you know, the charge is possession of fireworks, right? You know, all of us could have had a charge like that, you know, possession of fireworks. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, and, and I don't know if he's telling me the truth about the burglaries, but, but, um, you know, he's, he's charged burglarizing houses in his development that, um, you know, we're still semi-occupied. People were moving in, and and you know, in those times, doors, windows were just left open. So, um, uh, again, what's missing is this. Uh, you know, often serial killers commit fetish burglaries, and and um, sometimes for them, they actually will um, enter a premises when there's a person in the home, uh, and 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 kind of stand around. A, a person and that who's sleeping in their bed and that gives them a sense of power, power and control yeah. over the person. Yeah. And there's a um, sense, or there's, they're stealing. Well, I was just they're stealing fetishistic. Dark, uh, yeah. There's also that dark element of um, you are stepping into their life and you're, you're so, you're so yeah. sly that you can do anything you wanted to. Yes. So it's very much that hand of God power. Yes, yeah. And so I didn't get that sense from the way he was describing it. He was describing it as just him and his buddy, you know, saw these uh, houses in the development and there was stuff in there. Um, and, and so it was kind of a spontaneous, unpl- unplanned, unfantasized um, entry into places that, that wasn't kind of a planned burglary. He gets caught in any, in any regards and you know, I, I, I looked at his uh, probation reports from that era, and um, they describe him essentially the way he is today, as a very um, amiable, pleasant, um, good sense of humor, intelligent boy. Um, and and that's what I would describe him as, as a man. He's, um, as I say, very amiable, uh, friendly, good sense of humor i could see why the women would um trust him and and get into his car and 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 think that this guy is absolutely harmless you know right. and his well, two he... mistresses as well his two mistresses <laughs> testified in his defense that there was nothing kinky about him <laughs> you know uh so he really had this dr jekyll and mr hyde um, personality that would come out in certain circumstances with certain people, but everywhere else, um, you know, he was the good Dr. Jekyll, right. the father, the the reliable employee. You know? right. Peter, um, are you familiar with the movie 8mm? Um, I know of the movie, uh, that's quite a while back now, um, like 1990s maybe, 8mm. Right. Well, it kind of makes me think of <clears throat> the character, uh, the main, uh, the main villain in it. When they captured him and he was sort of unmasked, they were expecting, you know, like like in a horror movie, you know, Jason or Michael, you take it off his face. It's yeah. Really weird, or there's some obvious yeah. damage, and I remember the character was like, "You can't wrap your head around it." You know, yeah. I, I look just like you. I'm just like you. I am you. Yes. And yeah. I think that's what. I think that's the hardest thing, and I think it's also the draw for people a lot of times with yes. serial killers is that they're us. I mean, in a lot of ways, they walk among us, uh, do yeah. act just like we do have, and a lot of them do have that normal nine to five thing, but they have some something in their wiring that's just yeah. You know, he's it. yeah. It's it's you know ever since Ted Bundy, um, because I, I I think we always used to see serial killers as kind of being outcasts as kind of, you, you know, the Henry Lee Lucas vagrant, um, they're, they're, they're sort of cut off from society. But 
Um, once we experienced Ted Bundy, who you know attended law school and um, he worked for, uh, you know, he he was being groomed as a possible future candidate um, on a Republican Party ticket for governor of Washington State. Um, he was a popular date. Uh, people, you know, liked him. Uh, and 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 so he was indeed one of us. He had these middle class uh, conservative aspirations. Um, he was like our neighbors, like often you know we um, aspire to be. And 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 so Cunningham is another one of those um, individuals. Uh, a guy, like I said, raising three kids in the suburbs of New Jersey commuting every day to work in uh, an office, an office worker in Manhattan. Um, uh, you know, he's not someone you would immediate, immediately associate with that kind of, uh, you know, pathological behavior until uh, you kind of lift the carpet a bit and start looking what's, you know, what is he exactly doing? And, and of course, his wife, um, you know, he's not coming home anymore. He's arriving at home sometimes, you know, five in the morning, uh, seven in the morning. Uh, and, and, and so that's, you know, that's when she sues for divorce in, in, in 1979. And that's when he begins to melt down. I think the, when his island of stability, his reference point, his family, that begins to suddenly disintegrate. Um, I think that's when he himself kind of describes that period when he's, you know, cutting off heads and he's now um, one woman, he, he uh, severed her breasts, right? He's, you know, setting those hotel rooms on fire and, and, and he's getting reckless, almost suicidal. Uh, you, you know, I think that has to do with the meltdown that now is occurring in his other identity, in his, you know, so-called civilian identity. Um, when that comes apart, he just calls, you know, all, all out, uh, all in on, um, you know, the crimes he was committing. So it was just a matter of time now before um, he would have he would have been caught sooner or later. It was just coming. He's just, just getting too sloppy. I asked him, you know, how can you come back to the same hotel you know, where you killed another victim three weeks earlier, you know, you, he kind of claims that he was such a mastermind serial killer, carefully, uh, you know, choosing his methods and, and, and so forth. And, and, um, and I said, look, three weeks later, you come back to this place and he kind of shrugs and says, well, you know, it was convenient. I got sloppy. Um, and indeed he did. Well, Peter, do you think maybe, and maybe I'm trying to, cast a little bit of humanity to him do you think once he left and like you said lost that you know the rod that he held to that gave him some footing in humanity do you think he was just sort of like look i, I want to be called at this point you know i'm i'm going so far down this way i'm i'm okay. <coughs> i don't know how to stop yeah um it's possible um you know i, th I think you know the, the mutilation that he begins to uh, perpetrate is something that he hadn't done in his earlier crimes. Um, and, and my interpretation of, of that is that he's kind of trying to destroy this one thing that he's addicted to. Right. And, and so there is this kind of despondency, um, with which he, he is now just mutilating these, these women in a kind of a, like the frustration. I can't stop from these, um, Things. I mean, he would see women as these inanimate objects from these things luring me into this self-destructive behavior. And, um, you know, the last, the, like I said, the last um, crimes, the last few uh, murders they had committed, there was a lot of post-mortem uh, mutilation. And, and that was not evident in his earlier crimes. So he's definitely arcing towards this kind of meltdown. Now, whether he wants to be caught or, 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 you know, that's, that's a little bit, I think we often exaggerate that 
a notion that they all want to be caught, even on a subconscious level. Um, I don't think they do. There's, you know, um, I think the ones that want to be caught will actually surrender themselves, as as few of them have. Uh, but but there is this kind of almost suicidal uh, kind of going out of control. Like I say, he described it as a melt meltdown, and I, and I think that's the perfect description of it. He's also consuming uh, copious amounts of alcohol. Um, he has a resistance. He can uh, consume a lot of alcohol, so he does have a kind of a resistance to um, getting completely inebriated, but um, not enough to, you know, he's got two uh, DUIs on his record as well, um, but, you know, he was consuming alcohol very heavily. That was his uh, kind of drug of choice. Well, and everyone, I would assume, when you have those quiet times and when you're alone with just yourself, unless you are a complete, utter fiend, it's going to have to come back to you, you know? I mean... And I don't know, I mean, I've heard people talk about that on trial, which maybe they were trying to play the play the um, the jury as well to show a certain amount of humanity and remorse and whatnot. But I don't see how you couldn't, especially the ones that they that he showed such brutality to and to the point of, you know, like you said, just cutting them up like cold cuts. I don't, I don't yeah. think you couldn't really. He says um, that he still doesn't, quite feel remorse uh, but that cognitively he does um, he kind of un, un, uh, understands the damage and the hurt he has done to families to kids and, and, and so forth and um, he's more remorseful when he's familiar he becomes familiar with the victim and and um, their families and, and, and so in this case you know, when the daughter of one of the victims came to him and, and, and spoke with him and he, he met with her, um, he, he, as I say, he has this kind of intellectual remorse. I don't think he's capable of feeling it. Um, and certainly he doesn't feel it for the victims that are still anonymous. You know, um, and he still has a problem, even, you know, when we talk, when I talk to him, um, you know, he knows the story of the woman he beheaded, uh, but he still can't refer to her by name. Uh, he refers to her, you know, as the girl in the hotel. Um, even, you know, even though he knew her by another name um, and now he knows her by, you know, her real name because because of the daughter. Um, and, and yet he can't quite bring himself to refer to her by by name. It's still... You know the girl in the in the hotel I beheaded, right? Um, there were two girls there, so so he has, as I say, um, uh, kind of trying to make amends in 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 some ways. He's spoken with another um, victim's family member, a, a sister of um, a woman he had a, a young teenage girl he had abducted and uh, murdered. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, he's intellectually, he's trying to give victims closure whenever possible, when they come to him and, and, and approach him. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I think as a psychopath, he, he doesn't feel remorse. And, and so, you know, he's reached a certain age of wisdom. You know, he's not a stupid man. Um, and so he's now at the age of, you know, 72. He's facing his own uh, mortality. He's not in very good health. Um, and and so just intellectually, I think he's he's trying to make things right as, as much as he can and as he feels... Um, or he, as he understands, again, because I don't think he feels, as he uh, understands he should. Um, and so, And I think that's the best, um, you know, we're going to get from, from an individual like that. Now, I'm assuming they did all the psychological testing and all this. I mean, so they don't feel that he's 
schizophrenic, multiple personality. What we're no. doing. So he's, does he no. have any sort of dissocio- dissociative disorder, or is he just a psychopath? He's, um, we don't know yet, <laughs> you know. Um, the, you know, the, the sentencing psych reports on, on, on him, uh, they're not quite clear as what is the issue with him. Uh, other than, you know, there is this kind of um, dark, aggressive side to him. Um, it could be something biochemical, uh, you know, as in, 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 you know, Sons of Cain, my last book, I'm arguing that essentially, you know, we're all capable of being serial killers uh, biologically, that that when we were living in the primitive state in, you know, the caveman era prior to civilization, um, we all had to be serial killers um, as an animal species, essentially. Um, those of us who weren't capable of unfeelingly killing and, and, and sometimes cannibalizing what we killed as well um, would not have survived. Our species would not have survived. We had to be that. And, and, and so we were that way, um, you know, for at least three, four hundred thousand years. If we're talking just about, you know, the modern, highly evolved Homo sapien. All right. We had to be that way for for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's only in the last 15,000 years uh, that we've now suddenly uh, become civilized and tamed. And, and, and of course, you know, we develop these religious prescriptions against killing. Uh, we have societal norms, you know, when it's permissible to kill, when it's not permissible to kill. Um, but yet within our biology, those instincts uh, are, are, are there. And, and so my argument is is serial killers are not made. Um, it's all of us are unmade. The majority of us are unmade as serial killers by fortunate environmental circumstances, by good parenting, by good socialization, right? Those that um, uh, are serial killers are those that remained in their natural born state with these highly developed killing instincts that are also now being triggered by, um, you know, sexual impulses, because, you know, along with, uh, in primitive times, along with the aggressive ability to kill what endangers you or flee from it, you, you know, you have that choice, you run from it, and if you can't run away from it, then you better be able to kill it. Right. So so you have to be able to go from zero to 100 uh, within a short period of time or else you don't survive. And in in the same way, the reproductive instinct, very important. Right. Um, and and again, of course, it wasn't monogamous sex. Right. Um, you know, often it was just forced sex. Males in the primitive world had sex whenever we they wanted to, and and you know that is today that is rape, right? And and so not only were we just as a species a um, you know serial killing raping uh, species, but you know we occasionally as well cannibalized. Um, so fifteen thousand years is not a long time. Um, you know, in the span of how long humanity has lived for us to be uh, shedding those instincts that are deeply embedded in any living thing, whether it's a cockroach uh, or a tiger um, or, you know, a, a civilized human being. Those instincts are still there in, in what we call the reptilian brain, the basal ganglia, where, where your basic survival and reproductive instincts and feeding instincts are located. And if one of those instincts go awry, the species won't survive. And, and, and so what I think, for example, sadism is, um, sadism is um, a kind of a fusion of the reproductive instinct, the sexual instinct, with the aggressive instinct, uh, and and what what the mystery is, of course, is what causes it. And 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 there we go back. You know, is that what psychopathy is? 
is psychopathy a, a kind of highly evolved survival instinct? Because one of the one of the theories of psychopathy is, um, you know, why are uh, frequently you see among serial killers adopted children who are, um, you know, like the son of Sam who was adopted into this loving family, um, yet he becomes a serial killer. And, and um, the idea is, is that, um, you know, if you're adopted, you've come from an institutional background where there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, contact with your mother. There wasn't that initial bonding to another human in an institution. And and so the idea is that an infant that, that doesn't um, bond with its mother, um, that's not cuddled, develops a... Uh, defensive mechanism. It doesn't feel the absence of the mother. Uh, that's how it survives. It shuts down its capacity to feel. Um, and, and that, of course, once it becomes an adult, what it learned to be like as an infant can't be unlearned. It's a kind of a permanent programming of, you know, the neural functions of the, of the brain. Um, and, and so along with that, they lose all other aspects of being able to relate to human beings in terms of empathy, being able to understand, um, you know, facial gestures and so things. And the best they can do is just mimic these things, you know, mimic sympathy, mimic, um, you know, empathy, but they can't actually feel it because that's how they survived. And, and, and so I think when you take a survival instinct and then you throw it into a civilized society, that survival instinct can be very, very destructive um, and aggressive if, if it's not, um, you know, socialized the way most of us are. I, I kind of compared it to um, obesity in modern society. You know, there's a reason you build up fat on your body. Uh, it's a survival aspect. It's very important. Um, in primitive eras when food was um, only sporadically available, that you could build up a fat storage in between the times food was not available. Now, food is constantly available, but our physiology is still in that primitive state where we build these fat reserves even though we don't need them. And, and so what was once for us as human beings an aspect of survival has now become this this destructive thing that we label obesity. Um, you know, serial killing is kind of like obesity. Peter, let me ask you real quick. Um, and just for everyone that's listening, uh, the, the full title is Sons of Cain, A History of Serial Killers from the Stone Age to the Present. Where can they find this in your, your other very well-written books at? Um, the books are available anywhere. Uh, books are sold. So uh, bookstores, uh, Barnes and Nobles, I know, certainly carries uh, a lot of my books. And Amazon, um, i iBooks, um, anywhere books are, are, are sold. So they're quite easily available. And nicely priced, I should say. You know, kudos to my publisher um, that, you know, these books are available. They're under twenty dollars. The books, you know, eighteen dollars, sixteen dollars, and 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 so forth. Uh, because often the, the you know books are just so overpriced and unnecessarily so. But but um, I'm glad my publisher uh, puts them out at a decent price where anybody can 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 acquire them. Let me ask you this too, uh, touching on the Sons of Cain thing. Uh, I have not yet been able to read it, but I was curious if you may have touched on. Vlad Tepish, and because if you talk to people, I've actually spoke to some folks that were from the Romanian area. Uh, they were coming over here. I think they were doing some sort of mission work, and they had come over here. And so anyway, we were touch, talking about the man, you know, as opposed yes. to the the myth and or the you know the, the the legend that builds up around them. And um, a lot of people in this area would be probably be surprised to know that you know that they may not now, but they at one time had you know holidays and grand statues to this guy because he was a national hero yes and, yeah you know and it was a time yeah. it was such a time of brutality that you know any great king in the time for you to protect your people you would have to have like you said be able to go to that reptilian brain in a heartbeat yeah you know um individuals like that like vlad tepish or say like caligula in the roman empire 
Um, you know, what you have to look at is contemporary accounts from, from that time. And, and a lot of people say, well, you know, Caligula wasn't a serial killer because, uh, you know, as a Caesar, um, just to maintain his power, that's what he had to do. But people in that era, in the time of Caligula and Nero, commented at that time at how unusual his acts were. Um, and, you know, you're talking about an era where people were killed publicly in, in arenas, you know, thrown to the lions, gladiatorial, bloodletting, right? Um, you know, it was a serial killing civilization, the right, Roman Crucifixions, Empire. all that. Right. Crucifixions, right? It was You know, cruelty was all around. But when you read the Romans in that period, when they write about Caligula, they all are already, already... Um, noting that his particular cruelty is unusual it's beyond uh the norm uh that he you know would kill at night that he would personally kill that he loved to gag his victims so i think in cases like vlad tepish uh like caligula uh, these individuals had this power over life and death i mean that's one thing that the the serial killer certainly seeks out he seeks out to have the same kind of power that that uh, you know a Vlad the Impaler had, or that a you know Roman emperor had, um, but I think they went beyond just what was politically necessary for them to do, and there was a kind of a sadistic pathology in which they were able to pursue their fantasies through the power. Um, that they had, you know, um, another parallel I drew as well for something like that is, of course, the witchcraft trials. Um, you know, people often uh, don't realize that, you know, witches, those witchcraft trials, the women that were put on trial were um, very frequently raped. Um, their genitals were mutilated. Um, a lot of the inquisitorial process of um, interrogating a witch involved um, mutilation of their of their genitals, uh, and 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 it was perpetrated not by priests or members of the clergy, but by uh, laymen contractors who were hired to do this, right? And 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 so you had this kind of opportunistic um, generation of like 200 years of this kind of serial killing of women that was permissible because they were being accused of witchcraft. But when you look at those tortures, there were pathologically sexual, sadistic uh, tortures. So, so uh, you know, often serial killing is 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 can be collective. Um, it it can be cloaked by other historical things or by you know phenomenon like defending you know one's people or defending against the evil of the devil who you know is communing with women who become witches um or, you know or whether it's today kind of misogynistic pornography that sets a kind of social uh context a, a script essentially that serial killers can 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 follow um, you know fetishes change from time to time you know before for example again you know before uh, prostitutes were uh, favorite targets of serial killers um, in the early industrial period um, I see that servant girls were the favorite target um, and and there was this kind of targeting of not only servant girls but fetishes around um, the clothing that servant girls were wore at that time, um, and even today you still see you know the the French maid uh, kind of fetish in sexual play, right or or dungeon play that that again echoes from the inquisitorial period of the 1450s 1550s um well, so well it seems that you know definitely we have we've we're leaps and bounds ahead but we still have a lot of that baggage in us i mean we we still yeah as far as we are we're still right there on certain elements i'm not saying everybody but there's you know you see it every day you see it yeah in religions, we're one you see it in 
like you said, all that different sort of play and, and, and yeah, sexual we're one, so. yeah, we're one step away still from our primitive, from our primitive state, and and you know, it. I think it's going to take a lot, many more millennials, millenniums, um, before we kind of transform biologically um into what we've intellectually have been able to achieve the kind of level of civilization because it's extraordinary just how fast we have progressed especially um you know not only in the last 20 years but you know in the last 50 years 60 years and so forth uh the last 200 years i mean uh, basically for thousands of years human beings and our technology and our values and our morality was essentially the same uh but suddenly our um scientific capacity our technological capacity has just gone right off the charts in a way it never has in 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 human history um and 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 so you know if we were uh say 40,000 years ago just like another animal i mean what was the difference between humans and animals 50,000 years ago uh you know we didn't paint on caves we didn't have a language we didn't write um you know we were animals and, and, and suddenly now we're, you know, flying airplanes and walking on the moon um, while animals basically have remained the same as they were always. Um, and, and so certainly something has made us an extraordinary species that claims that we're not animals. I mean, you know, we claim we're humans, something very, very, very extraordinarily unique. And there's a certain truth to that. Yet at the same time, you know, we come from the animal kingdom, and and and, and so how much of that have have we shed? Well, you know, that's very well said, and that's sort of the crux of it. You know, we're not going to know until a long time from now. Yeah, most likely. And yeah, let, let me ask you this: in the last couple of minutes, I've got uh, before before we fade out, uh, what is something that you feel that from this point on, do you see any changes in regards of what is the psychopath? What is the sociopath? Is it is it changing? Is it change, becoming something more in, integrated with technology? Now, definitely, it would say it would be easier to be used with technology, but do you see the way the, the MO of all this? Has it grown? Has it morphed with something? Well, it's constantly morphing. Um, you know, we constantly see different... Um, categories of serial killers um uh we see you know serial killers define kind of statistical norms as you know some are killing at a much later age than statistically was the norm you know normally serial killers start at the age of 27 28 that's usually when they first commit again statistically speaking but you know we have a case here in canada where we have a perpetrator that may have started in his 50s which would be very unusual um again in canada we had a case of a uh, senior uh, air force officer a colonel who was um in command of an air force base here who was uh arrested and, and confessed to two serial murders um, and a number of rapes and, and, and fetish burglaries. And he too started very late in, in his age. He started in his 40s, um, a successful military officer who, who, you know, who used to fly what is Canada's equivalent to Air Force One. He used to fly the Prime Minister um, and the Queen of England when, when she was on visits to Canada. He was the pilot, right? And yet he was a serial killer. Uh, so, so we're seeing serial killers that are defying, you know, the norm. And, and of course, the ubiquity of cell phones and video cameras, um, DNA, all, all, all that too means that serial killers who are forensically aware, and many of them are, um, have to change the way they, they operate. Um, it's very difficult for, you know, a serial killer now to um, operate, uh, you know, out of a cell phone range. Uh, they have to shed their cell phones. And, and, and of course, victims 
of course, you know, everybody carries a cell phone, so you still have that problem. Right. Uh, so, so, you know, that was not a problem Ted Bundy had. You know, linking him to his victims and him uh, in being in the proximity of his victims today, that's a much easier uh, task. Uh, you know, videos from just car cams, right, to uh, surveillance video, security video, home video, doorbell video, uh, right, that is constantly cropping up in, in, in murder cases as part of the evidence that is mustered against a, a perpetrator. So, so, you know, serial killers are very adaptable, so they have to uh, adapt to that. Um, the Internet, you know, serial killers no longer need to physically cruise um, a prostitute's uh, track. They now uh, can go online and, and seek out uh, victims either through online um, you know, postings or through online dating sites. Yeah, it's all uh, out there now, isn't it? Yeah. So, so you know, their 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 trolling territory, their killing territory, is also becoming virtual in the same way as you know, gaming is and education is. So, serial killers kind of move with technology, with 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 you know, uh, developments in how civilization works and psychopathy i imagine um reflects all those things so probably there will be changes in you know how we recognize psychopathy or diagnose it or its symptoms in right well peter uh you know we're, we're plumb out of time i want to remind everybody please go check out peter veronsky uh i will try to make sure to put up some other links for for Peter and uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up and listening to the show I want you to enjoy the rest of the day I want you to go out there and you know live your life don't don't be uh, don't be controlled by fear and enjoy don't, yourself don't be controlled by fear but listen to your instincts to your intuition that's it and as the sun settles and the shadows grow long do make sure to check your doors, check under your bed and your closet. You never know. You never know what's lurking in there. Check your mirror. You never know what's looking back at you. But until next time, I want to thank everybody. I want to make sure that you go to stevieasher.com. Check out my uh, show on YouTube under Conflict Radio and also WPKY 103.3 FM, the home of the Tiger here in Princeton, Kentucky. Until next time, everybody, have a great day and take care. Until next time, everybody.